welcome and uh, to a new week and a new parsha. And uh, I do want to say to you that uh, we're going to start where I believe we left off last year. However, at that particular time, I was doing these sessions on Facebook. And it's possible that I may have to, I may be able to post a link for you, find a way to do that so that you can access that, uh, because I cannot put this, at this point I don't know how to put those older files which were recorded on Facebook on the YouTube site. So I'm going to try and solve that and see if you're interested so that you can get hold of it. Or email me and I will send you the link. Just email me directly at... Uh, um, you can send it to Mordechai, M-O-R-D-E-C-A-I-M, at Mac.com, and that will get to me, and I will send you the link. So, we'll start off now with the bracha. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu, Melech HaOlam, Asher Kitshanu B'Mitzvotav, V'Tzivanu L'Atzok V'Hibrei Torah. Amen. And here goes the file. So, um, we are, just to catch up, uh, we are in the midst of the story, this beautiful, beautiful story of, um, and we are attributing this to Eliezer at the well, where you may recollect that he was sent by Abraham back to his homeland, back to his native land, back to, in fact, um, his uh, brother and his family, Abraham's brother and his family, we had learned at the end of Parshat Vayera about the birth of Rebecca, uh, and although that would have been basically, wasn't necessarily that Abraham would have known that Rebecca was to be Isaac's intended, but it, no matter what, Abraham does not want Isaac to marry a Canaanite uh, woman, and so he sends his servant back to his homeland, to his ancestral land, to find a wife. And I... Uh, um, a comment last year when we did this, it was pointed out that Eliezer's name is never mentioned directly in the story. Uh, so often it's referred to as Eliezer at the well, the assumption is being made that it's Eliezer, yet it's not mentioned. So I do want to share with you that there is a principle in the interpretation of Torah, that is, I should say in the traditional way of interpreting Torah, is that where you know something and where you don't know something, where the Torah is not explicit, you go back to where the Torah is explicit and you apply that explicit reference to the new situation, which is not explicit. And here's such a case. Here's such a case. So we know that from earlier on about Eliezer, and he is the only servant of Abraham's that's mentioned by name. And so the assumption is that if the Torah doesn't mention a servant's name here, it's referring to Eliezer, because that's the only servant we know. And that's, as I said, it's a principle of interpretation. So um, I'm going to be comfortable with referring to Eliezer rather than the servant, even though the text refers to him as the servant. But nevertheless, that he is Abraham's, because we know that Eliezer was the head of the household. For Abraham, and we know that uh, from the story of the rescue of Lot back there. So, going into the story itself, we know that Eliezer prays to God to show him, to give him a sign as to who the right person is, so that he has some idea. And no sooner are those words out of his mouth that Rebecca comes to the well to draw water for her family. Uh, just a side that we should never underestimate the the miracle of indoor plumbing. So, at any rate, just makes life so much easier, incredibly. At any rate, um, we'll take it at verse 17 here. Vaya rots ha'eved likrata. The ser see how he's referred to as the servant. The servant ran to meet her. Vayomer, and he said. Hagmi'ini na ma'at mikadech. Please, there's the na, please uh, give me a little water from your pitcher. And there's a special verb in Hebrew that refers to offering water to drink. So we probably should really tra translate this as, please give me water to drink 
from, yeah, here's the water, Matthew, a little water from your pitcher. We'll see if there's a Rashi on this, and here we go. Vaya rots ha'eved likrata, the servant ran to greet her. The fi shira'a she'alu ha'mayim likrata. Now this is a, a famous, although uh, puzzling in some ways, interpretation. And it literally it means, the fi, because ra'a he saw, that the waters rose to meet her, to greet her. Um, obviously, taking that on a literary level, or literal level, I should say, literal, um, is hard to imagine. Uh, on the other hand, from a literary level, uh, there are obviously some statements being made here about um, just how, I guess, I'm trying to think myself, you know, um, about well certainly it's talking about her righteousness and it's also saying something about how when you are a righteous person uh, that there is divine providence that surrounds you and i could say that what i could understand is that eliezer even though it's being stated in this particular way by the interpretation that eliezer recognized that there was something special about her i mean on a very simple level that's what the story is telling us. And sometimes you do notice about another individual that there is something special and good about them. And he had this sense. And, um, of course, if the water is coming to greet her and she's going to get water, fetch water for her family, it's essentially saying that, her, that she was blessed, that, that God was blessing her in terms of the task that she had. Um, so you can see, I'm, I'm simply trying to play around with what the Midrash is trying to tell us here. And, and I think that's part of the engagement with the text. Please, uh, welcome a comment. I think she was very generous mm -hmm. when she came. Very generous. Uh, uh, um, Sarah wasn't that generous, but she was. Rebecca was very generous. And that's what, that's what uh, um, uh, Isaac uh, needed. Okay, so Harlan, um, we are going to see how generous Rebecca was in a moment in terms of her actions. Uh, the other, you know, they say comparisons are odious, and I don't, th I, if you'll please forgive me, I would not want to say that Sarah was not generous, because when the servants came, oh, excuse me, when the angels came to visit Abraham, um, Sarah had a lot of work to do to take care of those, th those, those angels. So I, I would not say that Sarah wasn't generous. It's uh, comparing it's, apples and oranges. Exactly. I, very it's well not said. Nearly, yeah, it's a different I situation. Agree. It is. But I wouldn't de denigrate Sarah in comparison to Rebecca. They were both great women. They both were, and in different ways in some ways. So plus forgive me for, for correcting you there. So... Uh, at any rate, but I think we have to play around. I'm, I'm certainly not answering all the questions about this, this interesting statement here, and it's, it's something to meditate on. You know, why, why does the Midrash choose to use this particular way to describe uh, Rebecca's worthiness? But I think there's some deep, deep things being said in this particular statement. And, and I think it's worth my commenting saying that, you know, people come across these sorts of statements and they tend to denigrate and, and, and think that, that um, you know, the authors of the Midrash are unsophisticated and what have you. And sadly, it's, it's just the opposite. And I've been reading fairy tales, forgive me for editorializing for a moment, but I have been thinking, I've been reading uh, a, um, Elijah's Violin. It's a collection of fairy tales collected by Howard Schwartz. And he has a preface where he talks about some of the analysis that's done of fairy tales and how fairy tales actually are ways in which um, very deep psychological and spiritual um, truths are stated. But we, use, we have to go beyond uh, declarative language in order to get to these kinds of things. And this is this kind of statement. And the Midrash certainly, and even the Bible, I feel, at times doesn't shirk from having to go into this particular 
way of talking about things. So, so uh, this, this, this water, yeah, just a quick comment. So if the water is rising to greet her actually kind of indicate, you know, along the lines of what you said, indicate that she has an aura about her. You know, mm -hmm. she has that. Yeah, I mean, to me, that's the way I interpret it, right? If yes. the water tries to greet her, that that means that she has a heavenly aura or however you want right. to phrase it. Right. So. right, and that her relationship, by the way, and I go one step further, that her relationship to the natural world is such that the natural world, forgive me for anthropomorphizing, but that the natural world is happy, happy yeah. to have her presence. And yeah. I don't think that's, and I think there's a lot to think about in that regard, right? There's something really beautiful about talking in that kind of way. I mean, yeah. that, th but thank you. All right. So he goes on to say, hug me inina, right? Please give me to drink, right? So he says, uh, he's, uh, Rashi's, this is an unusual word, unusual word in Hebrew. And he says, lashon gemi'a, and Lauren, I will need to get your, um, your text help here in terms of the medieval French, okay? Uh, but the, uh, the in this particular version of the Rashi, this is sort of not in the original Rashi's, and that's why it's in the parentheses here. He says, shluken means going something like that, right? That's the onomatopoeia, right? And schlirfen, which definitely sounds like slurping, right? It's an act of drinking. So apparently, whatever this medieval, however you pronounce this, right? And it's very hard to sometimes figure out how it's pronounced just from the Hebrew, how it's spelt in the Hebrew. So, so yeah, I, I also want to say that they had translated in the text as um, give me a sip, and then it says okay. an expression of swallowing. And right. then in Old French, it says ume, H-U-M-E-R, ume. Yes. Right, so I'm totally unfamiliar with that French word. Me too. But yeah, I like that. Um, but it could be in related to humid or something which has to do mm, with liquid. Water, and... right, something liquid. <clears throat> By the way, I really like the, the, the fact that they translated it as a sip, right? Although Esau later, I think, uses the same verb, and there it sort of has more to do with, you know, gulping, oh. gulping. But <laughs> I think using sipping here in other words he's asking here he is talking to a strange woman right and a strange young woman and and he's he's asking her for a favor he doesn't know her and so he's simply asking for her a tiny bit right a sip i think that's a really great way to translate it even though the yiddish here doesn't i don't think sort of translates it the word that way uh, because and certainly because yeah, they use as I said, Esau uses the same word later on, and it doesn't mean it. You well, this way, the, it means the, like the or something. Yeah, go ahead. It's swallowing, so yes, which would yes. be could be a, a sip or a, a go. right, right. But I, I go ahead, went ahead and used sip mm -hmm. in the translation. They did. Yeah, I, I they, think they tend good. to take the the Rashi mm -hmm. a lot. I've mm -hmm. noticed on the translations. Right. Well, he's our traditional. He brings yep. to us the traditional uh, interpretation of it. So let's go on. I think that is the Rashi here. Yes. On to the next verse. Vatomer, and she said, Shte Adonai, Adoni, my Lord, drink, drink. So it's not a gemia, it's a drink. Vatimaher, and she hurried, right? There's, there's something that's a sign of care right she hurried the torrid kada al yada the tashkehu and she took off she took off the pitcher uh with her hands and she literally it means she watered him right she gave him to drink so. but the you know i noticed back when the strangers visit abraham abraham says to his wife says to sarah mahari hurry up so, you know, showing alacrity is a sign of deep respect and care that you don't just take your own sweet time to do what someone else is asking you to do. When you do it right away, right, shows your desire to please them. Okay. No, ah, oh yeah, there's a little Rashi. Vatored Kada, she took off the pitcher. And, and Rashi puts in some words that are missing in the text. 
that are implied may al shikma from off her shoulders. And again, you know, it's all this involves effort. Water is not light, right? She had to schlep this thing off her shoulders in order to empty the pitcher or, you know, into into a cup or whatever it was, or maybe he drank from the pitcher, I don't know. But regardless, um, effort, effort. Now goes, this is the point that Harlan was making later on of how generous she is. She finished giving him to drink. And she says to him, I will draw water even well, not, not, yeah, even, gum, even, for your camels. Ad in kilun lishtot, until they have finished drinking. How much water does a camel drink? I'm sure it's more than one pitcher. I'm okay. sure it's quite a few pitchers that camels will drink. But the fact that she was so, showing such concern for a stranger, and remember, Showing concern for strangers is a basic Jewish value. Genesis is definitely trying to show there's a parallel here with how Abraham treats his strangers, you know, welcomed these people, and how Rebecca is treating strangers. And that is so counterintuitive. We tend to treat strangers with suspicion. And there is something really so moving about that, con- that consideration. That ask yourselves how the world would change if people treated strangers with this kind of behavior. Ask, um, that's why it's so important. But putting that into practice, I mean, here we're talking a story. Putting it into practice isn't always so easy. Uh, I, I have some interesting stories about that in my own past, but it is it is something to think about. Uh, let's take a look. Okay, Ad Im Kalut, down here for the Rashi. I'm just trying to find my marker. Here it is. <coughs> Ad Im Kalut, till they end, finish. Hare, so he's telling you, so Im means generally if, right? But here it just simply means, literally, it's sort of that, right? Hare im, the word im, mishamesh belashon ashir. Here the word im, it's a utility word, it, it's understood as ad asher, until, right? Asher, the asher that goes with ad, right? Ad, ad im is like ad asher, is what Rashi is saying. That if we st- substituted the word asher here, it would be easier to understand literally what the Hebrew is saying. So again, the, the various, if you sort of break down the various tasks that Rashi has in, in pulling out the text for us. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm sorry, is someone saying something? It's Judith. Um, so why do they use a different word? And what comment does he make about uh, them having used a different word? Okay. Uh, let's, okay. So interestingly enough, Rashi is going to quote the Targum right now. So you see that he's he's talking here about Im Kalu. So Judith, of course, you're asking a wonderful question. But I'm going to try and work with this here and see if this maybe sheds light on the question you're asking. Okay? So he says, Tirgame Onkelos. He says the Aramaic translation translates it as Di Sifkun. In other words, until they have completed. Right? Shezohi Gemar Shtiatan. Because we are talking here about the end of their drinking. Keshishatu Dai Sfukan, when they have drunk enough to satisfy them. So, um, whether or not this is answering your question, I am not certain. But if we were to understand the basic meaning of if, right, as if, um, that, that may be what it's doing, uh, Judith, is emphasizing the fact 
that they are going to be satisfied, as opposed to until they stop drinking, right? So the im here, if I'm understanding this Rashi properly, he's saying the use of the word im in terms of if, if they have finished drinking, as opposed to until they finish drinking, that there's an, a certain emphasis, uh, a subtle emphasis saying they are the ones who are finished. They are satisfied. Okay? I have a dumb so, question to ask. Yeah, yeah. What happened, what happened to the 10 men that were with him? What, did they get drink too? Oh. He had, he had people with him. The yes. Servant. Yes. So, right. I mean, this, you're, you know, we're asking a question and I think we just have to assume it, uh, Harlan, it's because it's not an essential part of the story here. That is, if it's said in the story, so we can try and approach this question. It's a good question. Uh, why, you know, why the Torah doesn't actually mention that. So the Torah is economical in terms of what it tries to, to get across to us. And so, it would have been very nice for the Torah to mention that she, she gave his men to drink as well. But there's an additional point that you make when you're saying that she cared about the animals. So caring about fellow human beings, as we've said, you know, treating the stranger um, hospitably is very, very important, very fundamental. But here we're saying it's even extending. I mean, what we're trying to bring out in this story is just how she went so far beyond. And if, if it had mentioned the men and then mentioned the camels, the point about the men actually sort of would have been swallowed up in terms of the point that's being made about the fact that she's giving the camels to drink. So uh, I think your, your question is really a good question because you're allowing us to maybe dig deeper into, style, into the style of, of the biblical style, which, as I said, we have to understand is basically economical. So if the Torah can make the point in a more economical way, it's going to go and make the point in a more economical way. Generally, are the exceptions to the rule? Yes, there are. But usually when the Torah isn't being economical in terms of its verbiage, there's a reason for that as well. Okay? Yeah. I have a quick question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so is it also possible that, that, or can you also relate this back to the previous point about the waters rising to greet her? Because... The camels are part of nature, right? And so if, if nature is delighted to see her, then it would be natural that, you know, she would also be delighted in nature and, you know, would want to not only help, you know, the, the people, but also, you know, the, the animals, right? So it'd be natural, you know, so besides certainly an act of generosity, is it also a linkage to her relationship to nature? I mean, yes. that's... that's Yep. No, I think that's very cool. Yes, I, I think it does. And as you were as you were expressing this, uh, it, it occurred to me that, you know, going back to that puzzling uh, Midrashic explanation, but also just to describe how happy she was to do this. In other words, that it's sort of a, you know, normally how do people feel when they have chores? And this is a real chore. Going to fetch water for the family because there's no indoor plumbing is a chore. And, and, that, and, here, and here we're having, by the way, how she does it. Her positive attitude about it, again, sort of counterintuitive as to how people normally behave. How do most people, how most of us, feel about having to do chores? You know, oh, do we feel that the water's coming to greet us? Do, do we feel that, that the dog is, you know, oh, well, the dog is certainly looking forward to us taking him for a walk, okay? But, but you understand where I'm coming from on this. Yep. So, yeah. So, I mean, I think this is part of what you're saying, that she's, that she has, uh, and I know it's, um, you know, it's a phrase perhaps overused, but that she has a real love of life. Judith, did you want to say something? No. Okay. You. All right. Okay. Um, so let's keep going. Oh, all right. Here we go. One more, one more verse. Vatima here again, right? Are we? Did we have this already? Yeah. Here's Vatima here here. Here's Vatima here here, right? So the Torah is emphasizing uh, the fact that she was hurrying. She was moving, and again, 
The point about hurrying is that it indicates the desire to please, the desire to do what you're being asked to do. When you're in a hurry to do it, you're, ex you're non-verbally communicating to the person that's asked you that favor how happy you are to do it, right? Because we tend to put off things we don't want to do, right? So. Yeah, remember that uh, uh, the uh, servant got to uh, ask her for a drink, but he didn't yes. ask her to do it with the camels. I know. He did it that's correct that's all showing him you're going to see his his reaction right we're not going to get to that first today god willing tomorrow but down here it says he is amazed okay so back let's just finish this up okay so she hurried and she emptied out her pitcher into the trough Vatarots, or again, look how the Torah is emphasizing, right? Vatarots means she ran. Vatarots od el habair lishov, and she ran again to uh, the uh, well, the be'er, the uh, that's well. the the water hole, right? Well. The well to well. draw water, to draw water. Vatishav lachol gemalav, and she drew water for all his camels, which probably means that every for every single camel, she had to go and get a pitcher of water. Okay. Vata'ar. Okay, so she emptied. Lashon nefitsa v'harbe yesh belashon mishna. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I can't remember offhand, uh, Nefitsa. Lauren, how do they translate that, please? Um, well, I'm not sure which word. So it says it's an expression of emptying. There are many examples in the language okay. of the Mishnah. Okay, so Nefitsa is emptying. That's how we translate it. I'm going to put that in. Thank you. There it is right there. Well, they're using... For emptying, they're using vatar and um, ara. Yes. And I don't see anything about, oh, so whatever. I'm no, he's, he's translating okay. with the okay. word vatar. And he's saying it is the, it is, has, the, has the denotation of emptying. And he says, vaharbe yesh balashon nishla. Okay, and there are many examples in Mishnaic Hebrew. And he says, So he's saying there are many examples of the word vata'ar. And here's the root, the one who empties, right, from one vessel into another vessel. Okay? Over Mikra, and, and he says, and in scripture, Yeshlo Dome, there is a similar usage of this word. And this is from Psalm 141. Al ta'ar nafshi. Do not pour out my soul. So he's simply commenting now on this verb. That's, that's not a common verb. I mean, his, of course, his knowledge of Hebrew is encyclopedic, but he's going to recognize words that are common and words that are not common. Okay? And then we've got an example in Isaiah. 53, lamut nafsho. So I, I don't recollect the exact context of this verse, but something to the effect which he poured out his soul to die. Something like that. Hashoket, again, a word, right? Um, so it sounds like Hashoket would have a, a, I said the trough, okay? Uh, but something to do, lashkot we know, means to give water. Okay? It says, Evan chalula, it is a hollowed out stone, shishotim ba kagmalim, from which the camels drink. So it is, the watering trough. That's what it is. And we're going to stop here. For um, I, yes. I, I oh. had a thought about whether or not he, she gave water to the ten men. Yes. Um, okay. And why it wasn't mentioned. Okay. Because um, Eliezer, you know, specifically 
expressed his desire, he asked for the water. The camels cannot express their desire. They cannot speak for themselves. So she was taking care of, of those who couldn't speak for themselves. And as far as the men, if they wanted water, they would ask her. And if they asked her, she would not have said no. So they, it wasn't really necessary because any man who expressed a desire for water, she would have watered them. And if they didn't, whether she did or not, didn't matter. So I, I, would, I would actually argue with that one um, because if the men saw that their leader had asked for water, uh, I think it would be in some ways impertinent for them to go ahead. I think we can assume that she gave them to drink. But I mean, you, it's not, not, my well, argument is not compelling either. It, it doesn't um, also contradict what I said, because if they weren't free to ask, yeah. my point was anybody who couldn't express it for themselves, she would have offered. Well, I love the point you're making about the fact that she had consideration for those who could not ask. That I, I think is a great point. And thank you. I appreciate that. And I just asked to be reminded, how do we know how, how many men were with him? We'd have to go back and see, okay, if he took people with him. But the assumption I would make is that he didn't necessarily go by himself, but I will have to go back. Uh, I'm going to stop recording right now and thank the people who've joined me and just repeat that I always appreciate comments and questions. And uh, you can email me or, um, or you can post them. At any rate, there is a place to post them in the in the YouTube uh, video. So, and I do take a look at them. So, I'm going to stop the recording now and thank those people who did. Let me stop this. I'm going to stop the share, and then stop the recording.